Uh, so uh, thank you, Stefan, for taking the time to talk to me today, uh, to me and to the students at the University of Waterloo and anybody else who may be watching this. Uh, I think what we're going to talk about is going to be valuable and uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, so I, th I thought I'd start just with uh, asking you to tell me a, a little bit about uh, your career. You've worked for a, a while now in data privacy and ethics especially around marketing. Uh, and uh, so I was interested in how your career led you to this point. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you for having me, uh, Peter. Um, I graduated uh, some 30 plus years ago in computer science. So all my career has been around the use of data to uh, understand business issues and try to use the right technology to optimize process, business processes and stuff. So, so marketing and uh, going on, on the web and working for so many years on the web isn't really different. It, marketing is a process, uh, it uses a lot of data and so on. Eventually I did an MBA uh, specialized in e-business uh, because I wanted to complement my, my understanding of the technology and computer science with the understanding of the business. Um, and gradually I, I went from using data and, and uh, looking at web development and playing all those roles into uh, webmaster back in the years. Um, and eventually being a, a specialized in digital analytics. So measuring the behavior of people on websites and mobile apps and stuff like that. So basically looking at what kind of audience is coming to a website, uh, where do they come from, what are they trying to do, and, and does it work? Um, but while I was doing that, especially in the you know recent years, I saw a shift where it is just too easy to collect a ton of data. It is too easy to, you know, use machine learning and create models that uh, anyone can can use R or Python and play with a lot of data and, and create something, which is nice. You know, it's a, uh, in a way, it's a democratization of the use of data in a business context. But at the same time, there's a lot of abuse from the vendors in the ad tech and martech industry where they collect just a ton of data without user knowledge, without user consent, without user ability to view what data has been collected and so on. So so really that that's how I gradually started looking at it and said, no, no, that doesn't work. Something is wrong here. And even with GDPR uh, in Europe, uh, with the privacy law and even uh, here in Quebec, a new law is being proposed to reinforce that. Um, also, uh, the data leak uh, that happened for Desjardins uh, here in Quebec, it was, it was someone working in digital marketing uh, who did it. Uh, because, you know, human beings being what they are, <laughs> it was too tempting to use the data for something that was evil. Um, and eventually, you know, uh, became what, what we heard in, in the news. And I came out uh, regarding Deja, uh, uh, they basically told everyone to go to Equifax uh, service, but Equifax has its own problems also in terms of the amount of data they collect, but also uh, the way they handle their website and their marketing. So I came out publicly uh, with an article, you know, basically pointing out, okay, here's what's wrong uh, with this company. Uh, so that kind of put me on the map in terms of privacy and ethics and so on and continuing in that direction. Okay, and so you've talked a little bit about what companies are doing with data at the moment. Overall, uh, to open our discussion, uh, how do you think the public should feel about the way that data is being collected mm. and used today? I mean, should people be concerned or, you know, how much well, concern should they be? I'll give you a, a super simple example of why everyone should be concerned. I was speaking, I was doing a keynote at, at a conference in Europe in front of between 1,500 and 2,000 people, all people working in, mar in digital marketing. And I asked them, so my presentation was about 
the risks of machine learning and automation in marketing. And I've always given examples of how something that seems so obvious and simple can actually do something evil, end up doing something that is bad. So I ask the audience, how many of you are using an ad blocker? And I was shocked. And I ask that question whenever I can, and there's you know an audience in front of me, because I, I was shocked because there's maybe well over 70% of the people in the room raised their hands. So those are people working in digital marketing and they are using ad blockers to block the ads. So it's like, what is wrong here? So, you know, you don't want to impose upon yourself what you impose on your own customers and your own audience. So something doesn't work here. So that was a big kind of a, a big, a nice example of there is something wrong going on. Uh, and at that same conference, I did an interview with um, uh, Christopher Wiley, uh, the guy from Cambridge Analytica. And in order to prepare for that interview, I, I read everything I could. I watched hours of testimonials. It, to me, for, for me, it was a unique opportunity to really have the guy <laughs> who, who, who broke out with the story of Cambridge Analytica in front of me and ask questions that haven't been asked before uh, as much as I could. Um, so for me, it was also a turning point in my, in my career to, to go to look at, okay, feeling that something is wrong and then being persuaded that yes, there's, there's something that needs to be done. So yes, we should be worried about the way companies are collecting data, the way they are not uh, keeping it safe. Uh, it's not even if a company is going to have a data leak, it's just a matter of when it's going to happen. So there's two sides to it is the more data you collect, the higher the risk of a data leak and the more interesting the data leak becomes also from for hackers and stuff like that, like in the Desjardins case uh, in Quebec. Um, so yes, we should be worried, especially in Canada, because the current legislation doesn't really protect us correctly. Uh, it, it is years behind what is being done in Europe, for example. Uh, so yeah. Okay, I'd like to pick up on two of the points you were making there. Mm -hmm. uh, the first was just what you were finishing on as far as the current legislation goes, uh, and also perhaps the work of the federal and provincial privacy commissioners. Uh, you know, they're in place to presumably to protect us uh, from the things that we're worried about as far as data is concerned. So, so how good are they at doing that? I think they, they try, they, they at least they do something that is really useful because some of the uh, release uh, that I, re I read from uh, the privacy commissioner are uh, really interesting, you know, it's to the point and so on. And, and they often, you know, take, okay, here's the case and here's the impact or the result uh, from that case, which is great. But if you compare the, the thief, of, of this uh, role compared to uh, what happened in the US, uh, Facebook was fined, uh, what, $9 million for... It, it's such a small amount, you know, Facebook makes that amount of money in a matter of a few minutes or a few hours. Uh, when you compare to the impact, the legal impact of not abiding by the law uh, in Europe and the fines that go al along with that, um, so this needs to be improved. But the other area that really annoys me is the current legislation is about personal data. So we all understand that a name, an email, an address, you know, all of that is personal data, our, our uh, birth date and so on. This is all personal data. But the problem is in, in digital marketing, there's all those ad tech companies or, or we say ad tech for advertising uh, technologies and, and martech for marketing technology so all of those companies and there's something like uh, there's a nice graph that shows there's something like 8,000 companies in that space um, doing all kinds of things from you know uh, just having a chat or uh, ad networks that are tracking you when you surf the web or all kinds of services 
The problem is most of those companies, they don't ask for personal data. They don't have to ask for your name or email or stuff like that. They, they simply track you when you surf the web. The problem is as you surf, they collect, they, they gradually build a profile about you, even without any personal data, but in the database, in the big, big data that ends up being there, there's only one record that represents you. There's only one record that specifically say, this individual, we don't know exactly who it is, but this is the behavior of that person. So it creates a segment of one, only one person. It's, it's a little bit like our DNA, but from a digital standpoint. So there's only one person who has such specific behavior and, and those habits of surfing and so on, they, they can uh, derive or they can uh, find out uh, your uh, religious belief, your political interest, your sexual orientation, and all kind of information, even if you've never told them. And all of that actually doesn't really fall under the current uh, legislation because when they collect the data, they're not actually collecting personal data. They are collecting anonymous data. So it's really, really hard to prove that a company is doing something that is illegal because if you ask them, they will say, no, 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 we're just collecting anonymous data. But they are collecting so many of it that eventually it becomes dangerous. Yeah, that makes sense and, uh, and enables them then to exploit that in ways that are not going to be good. Yeah, exactly. Or, or I don't think anybody, uh, well, there are people who would wake up in the morning saying, oh, how can we exploit people to their maximum, of course. Uh, but I think generally speaking, people working in digital marketing, they, they don't wake up in the, in the morning and say, oh, how can we leverage the data in a way that would be harmful or you know evil or things like that but it's just we've been conditioned to accept the fact that we are being tracked where we we accept that uh you know those statements that we hear all the time that um if it's free it's because you're you're the product uh you know th that exchange that okay i'm willing to give some of my data in exchange for a service if we understand exactly what is the relationship between the two, as a consumer, we might agree. We might say, oh, yes, I'm willing to do that because it provides me a service or benefit in return. Uh, it doesn't have to be money. It, it, it's just a matter of trust that I get something in return for something else. And that's fine. The problem is most people don't really understand what they are getting into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the, the, what the cost is of what they're giving away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's there's kind of a, uh, it, it's not an equal, you know, a, a give a give something in exchange for something of, of the similar value. The equation is not really uh, beneficial for the consumer. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Chris Wiley. Uh, yeah. I read uh, your article about him. He, he was the Canadian who was responsible uh, for telling the world about Cambridge Analytica. Uh, I thought your article was great to read. If anybody who's watching this, they should look it up. It's, it's a great read. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, very entertaining too. Uh, but can you just, for people who aren't really familiar with it, tell people what Cambridge Analytica was all about mm -hmm. uh, and how it uh, helped us to better understand ethical data gathering and use of data. Yeah, so we can start with something very simple. When we say Cambridge, what comes to mind? University of Cambridge. So even the name Cambridge Analytica was, was not a coincidence. They uh, positioned themselves as being uh, something for academia, something for research. They asked uh, Facebook, Here's a, we have an application uh, that we want to use on the Facebook environment. Um, and it was uh, called your digital life. So it's one of those many things that you see on Facebook, you know, uh, a little quiz, ask a few questions and so on. But the problem is in order to use those, those things, it will ask you for some permissions. And the permissions that the application was asking for was, of course, 
uh, access to your profile. So it means your name, your uh, birthday, uh, the, all the details in your profile, even, even uh, as far as uh, maybe pictures, uh, what you posted, uh, and so on. But from there, it was also asking for your contacts, so all your friends on Facebook. So it grew to access to millions and millions of profiles. So behind that academia and, and you know, research, um, which was really not the case, um, they leveraged the data to create uh, different profiles, different uh, segments of profiles, where they, uh, through machine learning and big data and all those things again, they were able to ident identify what are the characteristics of people who would be maybe more willing to vote for Trump and what are the triggers. So if you are uh, uh, pro firearms, for example, which would be typically representative of the Trump uh, people, um, but which, what is the exact trigger that will be interesting for you. So if you live um, in a big city, maybe it's going to be your safety. If you live in a suburb, maybe it's going, it's going to be the safety of your family. If you live the countryside, maybe it's going to be the right to uh, go hunting. Um, so they were able to, to find exactly the right triggers, the right incentive, so people would uh, be convinced to vote for Trump. And then, that same company, Cambridge Analytica, was also involved in uh, their, their um, they were owned by another company that was specialized in managing uh, elections. And so you have the stories of the Russians being involved and then you couple the, this very, very accurate uh, digital marketing with influence from external entities uh, who are uh, involved in social media and creating groups and, and Facebook pages and being involved. So, so that whole thing uh, emerged as being, of course, an abuse of the system, uh, an abuse of the way they collected, collected the data. Um, it was not informed consent when people agreed to the application. And, and of course, the abuse they did with it. And we realized for the first time that a company like that had the capability of um, really playing with uh, politics, but also destabilize um, democracies. So they were involved in the US election, but they were also involved in the Brexit, and they were involved in uh, African elections also. And there's all kind of, you should read the article for, for those who are listening, there's all kind of interesting tidbits. There's spies involved, there are, you know, uh, the FBI, the MI6, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things involved with that. It's, it's pretty crazy. But in the end, the reality is right now out there, there are other companies that are doing exactly, or I, would say, I wouldn't say they are doing the same thing. They have the capability of doing exactly the same thing that Cambridge was doing. And I would say, well, what's the problem? You know, is it because, well, they cheated on the way they collected the data? Okay, many people do that, by the way. <laughs> many companies do they cheat on uh, their legitimacy of asking. Well, they had super great data scientists who were able to create great uh, marketing uh, uh, segments and automation and stuff. Well, good for them. Their marketing was very, 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 very effective. Good for them. So what's, what's wrong with Cambridge? So my conclusion, my personal conclusion is actually what's wrong is that when you are, when you are the, it's like in World War II, you know, when, when you're the subject of um, manipulation and you don't know it, everything seems fine. So with Cambridge, what happened is eventually people found out that they were being manipulated. If you don't know you are being manipulated, everything looks fine. It's like, okay, it's just marketing. And then one of the things I asked for that, uh, that keynote that I was presenting in, in Europe is a scenario where you're a digital marketer and you have access to 50 or 60 million profiles 
and you have a great team of data scientists to sell chocolate bars or sport shoes, would you say no as a digital marketer? Of course you would say, oh yeah, that's, that's a dream job. It's, it's nice, a lot of data, a good team. Let's do great marketing with that. Well, one of the things that the model from Cambridge found out is that people who loved uh, the Nike brand and the Kit Kat chocolate bars were more susceptible of voting for Trump. For, I don't know if it's exactly that, but anyway, you know, something like that. So you take a combination. I can't explain why, but the model, the, the, you know, the, uh, from the data, they were able to say, well, people who like this brand and this brand combined together, they are more susceptible of voting in, for this party or this other party. So as a marketer, you think what you're doing is just fine. I'm just selling chocolate bars. I am, I'm doing my work, but the end result is abuse of the data and the potential to destabilize democracies worldwide. So this is pretty scary. And most people, I think, once they found out about Cambridge Analytica, uh, re, uh, accepted or believed that a line had been crossed. Uh, but mm -hmm. now, and Chris Wiley, I guess, was one of those people because he blew the whistle as far as Cambridge Analytica was concerned. But I was fascinated to learn in your article that Wiley then went on to work for H&M uh, and uh, is now applying the techniques that he knew from Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. uh, in marketing for them. So that raises the question uh, in, you know, non-political perhaps, uh, other uh, ordinary marketing, consumer marketing for retail or whatever it might be, uh, where are the boundaries or, you know, yeah. what, what are the limits? Well, uh, one of the things that happened with this uh, interview that I had with uh, Christopher Wiley is that I ended up spending a good 30 to 30, 45 minutes alone in a, a small room uh, backstage. And he was just, you know, super open in the conversation. So there's a couple of things that kind of are still in the back of my head. Uh, things that, that people never really asked him and I didn't have the chance to ask him. For example, Christopher Wiley from the accounts that we have is the master behind the whole concept. So did he came out as a whistleblower because at one point, of course, what he's saying now is that he saw the consequence of what he was doing and was not comfortable with it. So that's why he came out. But the journalist who uncovered the story, it took her a whole year, if not more, to convince him to actually come out. So did he become the whistleblower because really he has some, uh, you know, uh, remorse or, or, you know, conscious, conscious, he didn't like what, what was happening or because he felt that the water was getting too hot and his only way out was to actually become the whistleblower. So if we put that aside, one of the things that he said, and the guy is brilliant. Uh, the guy has official personality, he's brilliant. He studied in economics and politics and in fashion and design. And one of the things that he said is to change politics, you need to change culture. And when you think of it, the, the culture of, of those who would vote for uh, liberals versus uh, another party, uh, culturally they have some values, they have some you know, beliefs. And, and so if you want to change the politics, you need to play on those cultural aspects. And H&M is fashion and design, and it can influence uh, culture. Uh, it can influence trends and things like that. So, so you know, in some ways there is still some politics involved. Uh, but maybe it's, it's, you know, not as obvious as Cambridge and Cambridge and Antica. Uh, but that, that's, you know, all the, that story is so, so interesting. Yes. And it's, again, people can find it on Medium. And uh, I, I, th I thought it was very interesting as well. Uh, 
So we've talked about social media companies gathering data as well. Uh, and people who use social media usually know that, that, that there is a lot of, of data being gathered and that they make their money by doing that. You talked earlier about uh, the uh, imbalance that there is there. Mm -hmm. uh, what should be done about that? You know, should, uh, should there be controls on what social media companies can do? Should citizens have the ability to control more? What do you think should be done? Yeah, we, we see there's, there's a, an evolution. Uh, if you look at Facebook, Facebook will say that you can actually control everything you can actually go and see your complete history of, of you know, all the details they know about you. Um, yes, that's true. And Google has the same concept and, and all the big social media, you know, have something similar where you can, if you dig in the right spot <laughs> in your settings and profiles and everything, yes, you can find the information and also by law, you can actually ask those companies to send you all the details. In fact, not just social media, but uh, any company, you can ask the details about what, what they know about you. The, the problem is in order to do that, you will need to prove that you are who you are. And in, to do that, you will need to provide them with even more personal data in order <laughs> to get it. Um, uh, Equifax is a good example of that, for example if you want to you know, have access and fix something. But it's true for any, any company. So in the case, if we take Facebook, yes, you can view, you can see that. Um, you can actually go into your settings and you can, say, you can see what Facebook think that you like in terms of brands, in terms of uh, topics and things like that. And you can actually go there and tweak it and say, no, 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 it's not true. I don't like this brand or I don't like this topic. So you can do that or you can remove everything. The only problem is if you do that, it will, come, it will creep on you again. It will recreate a profile about you the minute you've done your setup. There's now an option where you say, don't collect this kind of information. And of course, Facebook will put a message saying, oh no, no, don't do that. You know, you're, you're gonna lose such and such feature, we're going to still show you ads, but they will be less relevant to you. So you're better allow to allow us to, you know, show ads that are relevant. And that's one of the questions I ask my students also uh, in my class is um, knowing what you know about cookies and tracking and everything. Are you comfortable with that? And, um, and most of them will actually say, if I'm going to see ads, I might as well see ads that are targeted to me, that are relevant to me, rather than seeing something that is totally random. Um, you know, those statements that we hear all the time, I have nothing to hide. Um, everybody does it. Uh, you're, you know, when it's free, uh, it's because you are the product and, and things like that. Uh, I, I read a nice analogy is uh, when you go to the bathroom, we know what you're doing, but you still close the door. So that's privacy. <laughs> so that's a nice way to nice way to see it, right? Even mm -hmm. if we we know what you're doing, uh, everybody does it, and so on. You still close the door. You keep at least a level of privacy. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, so. The idea that people should be able to control their own data, you've discussed that, uh, is one approach to dealing with this. Another that I've heard uh, is that people should get some sort of financial return yeah. for, the, for the use that companies are making of their data. Do you have any thoughts on that aspect of it? There are some interesting uh, experiments or, or things that are going on. For example, the Brave uh, browser, they basically uh, uh, say, okay, if you allow us to show some ads, uh, we're going to reward you in some way. Um, that's one way to, to do it. Uh, I don't think, I haven't seen any of those initiatives really, really picking up and really working well. Because personally, what I think is, the problem is not being paid with, with hard money uh, for something. The problem is 
the imbalance between the value perceived by the consumer and what really happens behind the scene. If we understand that exchange of value, it doesn't have to be financial. It, it's just I'm willing to I'm willing to read a newspaper for free because I understand that there are ads and that's how they make money. So I'm willing if I like this magazine or newspaper, I'm willing to accept that that exchange. I don't have to, or I could say, well, I'm going to pay for a subscription and don't show me any ads, uh, which is actually one of the options. Uh, when you look at how newspapers have evolved, some of them are saying, if you don't accept our ads, you cannot access the site. Some others are saying, well, we won't show you ads, but please create a profile so that at least we know who you are. Or... Uh, make an exception, accept our ads, and we're going, to, we're going to be reasonable in the way we do it. You know, there are different ways of doing it, but it doesn't mean that the consumer uh, needs to be paid in order to accept the uh, sacrifice of giving away their privacy. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, another area that I wanted to talk about was that uh, as we're talking, uh, lots of countries are looking at what they might do with tracing apps mm. for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, you've written about this and you've had some concerns. Uh, I was keen to understand what those concerns were about the apps and possibly about their implementation and particularly what you thought the apps would need to do mm -hmm. to be acceptable from a privacy and ethics Standpoint. Yeah. Well, I, I guess be it those uh, specific uh, apps or any other apps, it's a matter of uh, transparency. It's a matter of, of course, the law uh, abiding by the rules of, of the law, uh, of course, but uh, transparency and having the safeguards or the systems in place. So having, a, an, especially for uh, COVID-19 uh, apps, having an ethical uh, or ethics uh, committee in place, um, open source, so that the source can be scrutinized at any moment, uh, clear disclosure of what data is being collected, how it is being used, and who's going to transform it into some knowledge or information that will be useful for uh, the community and, and you know, for our health and, and so on. So I think those are critical elements. So, for example, most of the apps, uh, if not all of them, uh, right now they are uh, aiming for uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, proximity tracing. And uh, from, from a security standpoint and from a privacy standpoint, there are a lot of people who raise flags that will be careful because Bluetooth can be hacked. Uh, it's not super accurate if you, it's actually, the signal is very strong. So if you are behind a wall, um, it will say that you were really close to that person. If you are behind a, um, a window, uh, it, it might say that you're very, very close, but in reality, you're from a, a health perspective, you're protected. Um, and most of those apps, when we look uh, globally, uh, the adoption rate is very low, and the efficiency is is not really proven uh, so far. Um, there was one application that was that had different approach using AI, and uh, that was uh, really um, it was by uh, Mila uh, uh, in Montreal, and uh, the application was called Covi, and they had a different approach to it. And they were super transparent. And that's an example where sometimes uh, while they were, you know, opening the debate publicly and being very transparent, they became the target of all the critics and all uh, the scrutiny of, uh, the scrutiny of uh, uh, privacy and, and security people and so on. But during that time, there were other initiatives that were maybe a little bit more uh, behind the door and not, taught, not making too many waves and they kind of uh, got, in the end, a more uh, visibility. So that, my personal opinion is that right now there are, I have concerns about uh, the 
uh, the lack of uh, ethical committee and details in some respect to how exactly the data is being is going to be used. Uh, from a legal standpoint, of course, you need to because it's personal data. Um, you need to disclose what is being collected, what's going, uh, how it's going to be used, how long it's going to remain, how long it's going to be available, and so on. So I'm sure they will they will cover all of those points. Um, my worry is that uh, when you look at similar application globally, the success is not very very good. So maybe something else would happen, and they will improve those apps over time, and it will become better, hopefully. Yeah, I think it, it's a fascinating case, I guess. Uh, the the, uh, the an app which, in theory, has you sacrificing privacy to a degree mm -hmm. in exchange for life, uh, if mm -hmm. they work. Yeah, um, it's a good, it's a good uh, and, <laughs> and that trade-off is doesn't really exist many other places. Yeah, but at the same time, they're not getting the uptake, which seems to. Uh, say a lot about people's level of confidence in technology and their fear about privacy and other things. You know, there's yeah. there, all, there, there seems to be a ton of issues there that are important. Or then you go to the other extreme where you say, "Oh, the app is going to be mandatory, and we're gonna we're gonna check your credit card records to see if you've made purchase in a different city." And we're going to use uh, uh, cameras to uh, do facial recognition to know if you went somewhere and stuff like that. And this is actually going on in in some parts of the world where they took a different approach. So so then it's a if you're going to invade my privacy, let's go all the way, <laughs> which I wouldn't agree with. But it's a different approach. Uh, so we'll see what's going to happen. Uh, but what worries me also is that through this kind of tracking, the masses are being conditioned to accept a level of, of privacy that is much lower than it was before the pandemic. So we're, we're, our acceptance level of privacy invasion is actually much higher than it was before. And that's probably going to remain afterward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So I also wanted to ask about organizations and their use of data analytics and machine learning and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. Uh, we've heard, uh, you know, the concerns about bias and misuse, uh, and also that many data projects have failed. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study uh, that said 85%. I think it was a Gartner study. Yeah. Uh, and I'd be interested in your comments. So we, we've talked all about what organizations might do, particularly some of the concerns about what they might do. But they also, from their, on their side, seem to be struggling to make it work. Yeah, well, is the 85% of, of AI or machine learning projects that are failing, it's not that different from a general IT projects that are failing, right? Um, so in a way, maybe we shouldn't worry as much as about the projects that are failing because they're, they're not there, they're, they're gone, right? But in the 15% that remains, how many of those projects are actually doing something where the algorithm is wrong, where the machine learning training created some bias or created some some thing that is that people didn't didn't see, and they went ahead with a system that uh, might be doing something evil. And we don't even know. Um, so that's that's why you know on 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 the one end you have the machine learning and AI, which is great, but at the same time there's also a discipline that is emerging, which is data ethics, because you want to prevent cases where there's going to be discrimination in the algorithm, not because a human said let's be biased toward men or women. But because the algorithm through the training finds out that for such and such, such thing, uh, men have a higher likelihood of doing something than women. So therefore, the, the algorithm is, you know, biased because of that. 
Um, and is it right? Is it wrong? If the algorithm is biased, after all, it's just a reflection of what is really happening in the data itself. And then we put our ass as human beings and say, this is wrong or this is right. Um, so yeah, I think I'm not surprised by the level of, of projects that are failing uh, because at the same time, we're uh, all learning also at the same time. So maybe it's part of the evolution. If, if you look at other, historically at other um, big transformation uh, like uh, customer relationship management or enterprise resource planning systems and things like that, <laughs> the success rate was really, really low. But today we almost take that for granted that if you start a new business, yes, you're going to have an ERP system or a CRM system or such and such system that used to be super expensive, very difficult to implement. So in the future, we can expect that this is just going to be normal to have big data systems and AI and stuff like that. And just got two further questions. Mm -hmm. The, the, the uh, 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 if this is going to grow in the future, which I'm sure you know it is, uh, for people who are considering a career in data analytics, mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you have? What would you say to them if, if they said, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, uh, should I do it? And what yeah. advice have you got? Yeah, despite, despite everything that I've been saying about privacy and ethics and data and abuse and stuff like that, it is a great field. It is... Um, for me, it's it's like uh, the analogy I often use is like playing Lego, the Lego blocks. You know, you you when you open the box, you look at the plan and you follow the plan, and you've got you build something with the Lego blocks, and that's great. But if you work with data and you're an analyst, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to look at oh, if I remove this little part and I replace it with something else, it's going to be better. And this is the essence of what I'm playing. Uh, you know, I'm like a kid playing all day long, solving problems, uh, being fascinated by the discoveries that I make. It's a super interesting field to be in. And there are great things that we can do with, with data. And oftentimes I use um, uh, a triangle to represent the opportunities uh, from a career standpoint. The tip, the, the upper tip of the triangle is Everything that relates to um, the business side of things, management, uh, setting the big uh, business objectives and so on. Then one of the, the other corner of the triangle is uh, the, what I call the uh, enabling capabilities. How do you make it real? So you need people who understand technology, who will understand, for example, uh, social media or websites or apps, or you know, they, they understand how to make it real. So they take the business objectives and they know how to build in order to answer those objectives. And then the other corner of the triangle is uh, people who have the capacity to do uh, problem solving, um, take a lot of data. And, and of course, when you create those capabilities, it, it generates data always. So you need people who are able to understand the data and summarize it into something relevant and useful and make recommendations back to the business. So you've got a nice triangle where everyone works together, but you can't have everything. So each of those angles is an opportunity to work in the field of uh, either on a technical standpoint, either on uh, more of an analysis standpoint and creating dashboards and communicating effectively and solving problems and from a business standpoint also because uh, every business works with data and they make decisions informed uh, by the data they, they collect. So lots of opportunities, uh, a great field really and, and a lot of uh, m much more opportunities also to learn uh, from uh, either universities or uh, in the field and there, there's a, uh, communities of experts in all of those areas. So uh, really, for those listening, go for it. <laughs> okay, and I also did want to pick up on one of the other parts of your triangle. 
uh, which is uh, you talk about the business people and how they're going to use it. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I thought I might drill down a little bit more on that just to say, you know, for people who aren't techies who have heard about this thing called data analytics mm -hmm. and they're thinking about how it can help their company, what would your, and this is my last question, what would your advice be uh, for them? Um, today, like anyone is able to use a word processor or do a PowerPoint presentation or use a spreadsheet and use them. It doesn't mean they are experts at doing it, but at least they can use those tools to express something. I think data literacy is a similar aspect. So you, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to understand the basics of how data can be used, uh, can be collected, in which way and, and how it's, it's right to do it and how it can be used to, to benefit either you personally, like look at the number of people who are using uh, you know, an Apple Watch and are tracking their sleep behavior and their, you know, all this is data and, and you do it because you want to improve your personal life. Uh, the same goes for your business. Uh, you need data, you need to understand uh, at least a minimum of how data can be used to, uh, as I mentioned, you know, not necessarily Sometimes we hear uh, data-driven organizations. I prefer to, to say data-informed because at the end of the day, data by itself doesn't make any decisions. We still, and hopefully it's going to remain like that, we still make the decisions as humans. Um, we might delegate some responsibilities to AI and machines and robots and so on, but we make the decision to do that. Uh, so data is there to inform our decisions, not to replace our what we do uh, from a business standpoint. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Stefan. Welcome. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you talking uh, and the students, uh, I think, will benefit greatly from what you've had to say. Thank you, Peter. It was nice. <laughs>